everybody online. Crossroads Recovery, we love you guys. Give Crossroads a big hand this morning. Every year, I love to do this to show that so the diversity in our church. How many of you have been coming to Pure Heart for more than 10 years? Raise your hand. More than 10 years. Look around. Look at that. Look at that. Look at that. How many more than five years? You've been coming to Pure Heart more than five years. Raise your hand. All right. How many more than a year? More than a year. Look at that. This is my favorite part. How many have joined us in the last year? Raise your hand. Last 12 months. Come on, give a big hand this morning. I love that. Let's, let's talk about church backgrounds for a second. How many of you came from a Baptist background? Put your Bible down, your big Bible, and raise your hand, all right? There you go. There's our Baptist folks in the house. How many came from a mainline background, uh, a mainline, you know, Lutheran or Presbyterian or Methodist? How many? Just slowly, real carefully. Yeah, because you... We don't want to scare those folks. They get scared easy. We got to be quiet. How many of you, these folks like to be heard? How many of you, charismatic Pentecostal background? Both, yeah, we heard you during worship. All right. How many came from a Catholic background? Catholics? All oh, right. Catholics, would you please stand? Would you just stand? <laughs> no, no, seriously, stand. Catholics, just stand, stand. And then, and then kneel and then sit. Okay. You weren't going to stand no matter what I did. You're like, I'm not standing for you. You're not a priest. Okay, so... Father, help us. All right. So all kinds of backgrounds. Here's my favorite. How many of you came to Pure Heart with no church background at all? Raise your hand. Raise it high. Come on. No, you had no church background. Look, 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 look. Over here, no church back. Come on. Love it. Love it. Our people. See, how many of you came because you were going through a difficulty in your life and a friend invited you to come? Anybody? A difficulty? Um, how, how many of you came because we used to have twisty palm trees on our campus? Anybody? And then we... We tore them down and made you mad. And then you had to forgive us because the Bible said so. All right. So no matter how you found us or no matter where you came from, you're not here by chance. It's part of God's plan. Can I get a yes? His holy divine connection that we be a part of each other's lives at this point in history with this group of people for such a time as this. From the beginning of time, God knew that we would be connected with one another. There's nothing in this life more valuable than relationship. Relationship with God and relationship with one another. It's the only thing that we'll take with us out of this life. And there are things in life that matter greatly. And what we know about things in life that matter greatly is that they're not always easy. How many of you discovered that good relationships, strong relationships are not easy? Can I get a mm-hmm from anybody this morning? And it's true. We are gifts from God to one another. It's true. Turn to your neighbor and say, I am a gift from God to you, all right? We're gifts from God to each other. But we know this about one another. We can get on each other's nerves. Now look at your neighbor and say this. You have the potential to bug me. Just tell them that right now. You have the potential to just drive me nuts. But God created us to need one another, to be in each other's lives. But it's not easy. Relationships aren't easy. A few weeks ago, I asked this all-important question. Who are you becoming? We talked about our greatest value as a church, becoming like Jesus for the sake of others. I want to add to that this weekend. Becoming like Jesus for the sake of others, with others. Say that last part with me. With others. Say it again. With others. Turn to your neighbor and say, with others. Most important factor in who we become it's who we spend time with. You show me your inner circle, I'll show you where you're gonna be in the next three to five years. You show me your inner circle, I'll show you who you are becoming. Listen, listen, no matter how great the church's vision is, no matter how white hot the purpose of a church is, if there's not healthy relationships, especially in leadership, that church will implode. Every church I've ever walked with or known that has struggled or had a crash, every single time there were issues in the relationship and it started in leadership. They weren't willing to dish, deal with the pain, the brokenness, the disunity, the unforgiveness on their, in their family, on their teams. Relationships are not easy. And listen to me, it's what we spend the least amount of time on. We spend so much time getting ahead, making money, paying bills, running here and there. We don't spend time really getting to know each other, getting out of these rows, into circle, and being known by one another. That's what God has called us to. And so I want to take a moment this morning, and I, want, I, could have, I could have spent weeks on this topic, but I want to take a moment this morning and talk about three things, three things I see in healthy, holy, divine connections and relationship. I want to talk about celebrate, consequence, and courage. Say it with me. Celebrate, consequence, and courage. One more time. Celebrate, consequence, and courage. I want to talk about that this morning. Open your Bibles with me and go with me to 2 Timothy chapter 4, and verse 6. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 6. 
Paul writes this to his son in the faith, Timothy. It's so real. It's so raw. It's so powerful. It's one of the main reasons I, I believe the Bible is true. Because in ancient literature, they always painted the heroes in perfect, almost mythological light. And the Bible shows the good and the bad and the ugly about its characters in the Bible. And so Paul is being extra real with Timothy. Most scholars believe this is the very last letter that Paul wrote. And so he opens up his heart in a very personal, vulnerable, and transparent way. And this is how he starts, verse 6, chapter 4, 2 Timothy. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time of my departure is near. Now listen to Paul's joy. Listen to his celebration, if you will. I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I've kept the faith. Now there is in store for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, Timothy, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. It's so good. He's celebrating. I fought the good fight. I finished the race. Every time I travel, everywhere I go, if, my, if I'm by myself, I think about Man, Nicole would love this restaurant. She would love this place. She's a real foodie. She loves food and she loves to bake. She loves to cook and I love to eat. We are a perfect marriage. <laughs> and I'll be in a restaurant and I'll think, man, Nicole would love this place. And so I look in the menu. She would, oh, she would order this. So I order her a meal and me a meal. And I just do it because I love her. All right. <laughs> How many of you know that life celebrations mean nothing unless you can celebrate them with somebody else? That you have somebody else to celebrate with. There's no real depth, no real meaning to it. Even our relationship with God and the story of the parable of the talents. Jesus says, well done, good and faithful servant. Now come and share in your master's happiness, in his joy, in his celebration. What's it going to look like to celebrate in the very presence of God himself one day? I was talking to a friend of mine this last week. He, he pastors at a local church, a wonderful church, and they, they had raised this offering to help other churches and he asked me, he said, Dan, is there, are there any projects that you don't have enough funding for that you'd like to have more funding for? And I said, let me pray about it. Here's a list. Okay? And get yourself something really nice. All right? So here's the list. And I, I showed it to him. And I said, the biggest thing is we have this studio that we built. But, you know, the, the equipment to put in it is really expensive. We were going to kind of do the best that we could to make it happen. But, man, the truth be known, we don't have all the funding that we need to make that happen. We want to bless other churches with it and let other churches use the studio and be able to record and do different things and video and audio. And he's like, well, what if we could um, give you like $200,000 for that? And I said, what if I kissed you on the face right here in front of everybody? <laughs> on the cheek, okay? I don't want to get weird. What if I, what if I hugged you inappropriately? And you got $200,000. He says, yeah. And I was so excited, but you know what I was more excited about? to get back and talk to the team about it, to celebrate with our guys and gals and say, guess what's happening? You're not gonna believe this. And they were so fired up. I know today some of the guys are gonna be going over with a, a guy in our church who's a professional and travels around the country and does audio video. And we're gonna look at what can we do to deck this thing out so that we can invite other churches who can't afford it to be able to be blessed right here on our campus. Isn't that exciting? Isn't that something fun to think about what God is doing? What are you celebrating? I, I was at the basketball game the other night at Cactus High School. My daughter plays, and uh, she's an incredible athlete. And so um, and we're, we're there watching her play, and, and this little boy, every week he's always, he likes to, this is what he likes to do, he likes to celebrate. Well, check this out. Oh, yeah. Get some. Come on. He's going to dab here in a minute. Watch this. Check it out. Check it out. Check it out. Here it comes. Bam! Bam! <laughs> and every week he does, every week. But last week it was so much fun because my mom and dad were with me. And we were hanging out together and just to laugh and, to, and, to, and, to sell, and just to love this kid's, his joy for life. It was so much more fun because my parents were right there with me hanging out and we could enjoy that moment together. Life is better when you have people to celebrate life with. Can I get an amen this morning? Amen. And then Paul goes on. This next statement is one of my favorite statements in the New Testament. Paul writes to Timothy, I, I finished the fight, the, the fight. I've, I've finished the race, I fought the good fight, I'm getting a crown of righteousness. And then he says this, do your best to come to me quickly. Tim, get here as fast as you can. Because life as I know it is seems to be seemingly falling down around me. Tim, great things are happening. I know God has a great plan for my life. Timothy, I need you to get here as fast as you can. 
For Demas, because he loved this world, has deserted me. He's gone to Thessalonica. Cretans has gone to Galatia. And Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Say that with me. Only Luke is with me. And then he says these words. Get Mark. Get Mark and bring him with you because he is helpful to me in ministry. What you need to know about Mark is that Paul had a blowout fight with a man named Barnabas over this man, Mark. They got in a huge fight. In, the, in, Luke's, in Luke's writings in the book of Acts, Luke wrote the book of Acts, it says that the fight was so bad, they had such a sharp disagreement, they parted company and went two different directions. Paul took off with Silas and Barnabas took off with Mark. They were angry at each other. Paul had a meltdown. And he, as a leader, he had a very unshining moment. And the Bible records that. Luke recorded that. They had a huge fight. He had an epic failure as a leader. And there was consequence for that. And there was brokenness in that. And what I want to know is this. When was it that Paul changed his mind about Mark? When was it he went to seeing him as helpful to me in my ministry? Maybe, maybe Barnabas and Paul got together a few years later because it was 20 years before this, 15 to 20 years before this, this fight took place, before Paul wrote the letter to Timothy. And maybe Barnabas talked about all the great things that Mark was doing and how much he had changed. We don't know. We don't know how this went down. Maybe Luke, because Luke is the only one with Paul in this moment. Maybe Luke, who recorded this fight and recorded this story, maybe Luke said, Paul, 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 listen, man, that, I love you, but you're out of bounds. Maybe he loved him enough as a brother to walk through his sin with him, to bring him to a different understanding and a whole new perspective. I don't know, but I do know this. I need brothers and sisters in Christ who will walk with me when I have epic failures. I need people who will love me. I, I called my friend the other day. I said, I had an epic failure as a dad. I told him the story. I told him what I did and how I reacted. And I, I, wasn't, I wasn't slow to become angry. I was really fast to become angry. And I said, I had an epic failure. And he, he just said, welcome to the dad life. And he told me a couple stories about his epic failures as a father. And we talked together and we walked together. And he says, I'm not giving up on you. And he encouraged me. He walked with me through the consequences, through the brokenness of my relationship with my son that day. We all need this. It's okay to not be okay. But it is absolutely not okay to pretend that you've got it all going on. Because none of us have it all going on. Just turn to your neighbor, don't say anything, just smile. <laughs> None of us have it all going on. And you don't have to stay stuck in that. When I fail, I need community to pick me back up, to show me grace, to say, I, I blew it as a dad, I, I blew it as a leader. I had a very good friend of mine, a young leader who I'm so proud of in ministry. He called me the other day, I have the privilege of mentoring him. He called me the other day, he says, I need to tell you something out loud. And I love how this young guy does this. He just, he lives vulnerably with me. He lives out loud with me. He says, I got to tell you something out loud. He says, I was in a meeting and there was, a, there was another lady in this meeting and my eyes were drawn to her and my heart was drawn to her and I, and I lusted after her. And I just needed to say it out loud. I needed to tell somebody. And I thought to myself, that's a great leader. Because better to have that conversation right now than the other conversation that goes, I got to tell you what I did. And I blew up my marriage and I blew up my church. Better that conversation than the other conversation. Better the conversation that says, I don't want to get to this consequence. I want to be real about it now. And you got to have great community to do that. People that you can trust, people you can walk with, brothers and sisters in Christ, you can be real with. And God promises us that in community, in his family called the church. We are not in each other's lives by chance. We're here because we need each other to celebrate with one another and to walk through the consequences of life together and to prevent those consequences in life together. Amen? Amen. Right, here comes an intense part. You ready? Paul goes on. He, he continues. Verse 12, he says, So I sent... We'll just call him Ty because nobody knows how to pronounce that name right there, all right? <laughs> and I know the church you came from, the pastor dazzled you with his ability with names. You ain't in that church anymore, okay? <laughs> so he, he sent this guy to Ephesus mostly because he couldn't pronounce his name. Um, <laughs> no, it's not, that's not in the Bible. <laughs> I made that part up. All right. He sent Tychicus to if Ephesus, all right? We, <laughs> I'm sorry. A little slap happy this morning. 
He says, when you come, bring the cloak I left with Carpus at Troas and my scrolls, especially the parchments. Now watch this. This is so good. He goes on, verse 14. Because Alexander, the metal worker, did me a great deal of harm. This next part is so raw. This next part is so human. This next part is so real. And the Lord will repay him for what he has done. I just love that. Like, he goes, you know, Alexander, yeah, he, he was a jerk to me. God's going to get him. That's basically how I paraphrase that. Okay? That's real talk right there, people. That's honesty right there. God's going to deal with him. I'm not taking revenge, but God, you deal with him, okay? He goes on, you too should be on your guard against him because he strongly opposed our message. At my first defense, watch it, no one came to my support. Everyone deserted me. May it not be held against them. See, trials work. This. Consequences for sin, I need somebody to help pick me back up. Trials are different than consequences for sin. Trials are, I did the right thing and I suffered anyway. I did the right thing. I said the right thing. I was trying to do the right thing and I suffered anyway. That's a trial. And my friend, one of the elders in our church, Dave Jensen, said to me on Wednesday, we were in prayer together with our elders, and he said, he said, listen, we're not, he said, the Lord put this on my heart, we're not called to fix people. Only Jesus can fix. Only Jesus can heal. Only Jesus can redeem. We're called to impart courage. We're called to encourage. We, we, we can't fix people in community, but we can encourage people in community. We can encourage them to keep moving forward to keep pressing on. A good friend of mine on Instagram the other day, she posted this. I thought it was really, really good. She put the word depression, and she said, if you mix up the letters of the word depression, you get, I pressed on. Come on, that, just turn to your neighbor and say, he finally started preaching. That's, that is good stuff right there. Yeah, I have certain people in my life that I know pray for me every day, sitting right here in this room. They pray for me every day. They speak love to me and truth to me, encouragement to me. And I press on. And you press on. That's the benefit of holy connection. That's the benefit of community. To celebrate with one another. To pick each other up and walk each other through the consequences of our own mistakes and sin. And to impart courage to one another. When we're going through the trials of this life. One of my favorite illustrations of this is a story I tell at every memorial service of back in the, the late 80s during the World Series in the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area, the Bay Bridge collapsed one level on top of the other during an earthquake, huge earthquake. How many remember the earthquake back in the 80s during the World Series? And so the, this Bay Bridge just collapsed one level on top of the other. So the engineers of the city went out and what they discovered is that the, the vertical holds were strong, but that the horizontal holds were weak. And the moment I heard that illustration, I thought to myself, we must be strong with God and we have to be strong with one another. You know why? Because the earth's going to quake. In this life, we will have trouble. In this life, we'll face things that break our hearts. Things we have no answers for and more questions than we ever thought we'd have. I'm going to tell one more story about my friends, Angelo and Sheila, who their son, their 28-year-old boy, died of a drug overdose a couple weeks ago. The earth quaked in their life in my life, in many of our lives. We love the Espinosas. We, I, I love Jeshua, their son. I got the privilege of being in his life several times to help point him toward detox as he wrestled. I know Jesh knew Jesus. He wrestled with Jesus, but he also wrestled with other things in this life too. And he struggled. And I remember getting the phone call at nine o'clock in the morning to go to the hospital on a Saturday. Just said, you know, tragedy, Jeshua, Jeshua. That's all it said, tragedy, Jeshua. I remember walking through the doors of the hospital room. I remember Ange and Sheila turning and looking at me. Jeshua laying in the bed on life support, no brain activity. And they just fell into my arms. And I held on to them with everything that I had. And they, they just went limp. They just, they just hung there. And, and I held them and I held them as hard as I could. And they were screaming and they were crying and they were mourning like I've never heard people mourn before. And I just held them with everything that I had. I did the memorial service the other day, and many of you were there. I started the memorial service off different than I normally start a memorial service. I started a little differently. I just stepped up to the front of the room, and I simply said this. We've had an earthquake. 
The whole world is shook. Our worlds have shook. So we're here today to celebrate Jesh's life and to hold on to one another and to build each other up, to be strong with God, to be strong with one another. That night we had a dinner and Angelo, as I was leaving, getting ready to go home and rest, to get ready for services the next day, I said to Ange, I said, um, I love you and we're going to walk with you through this. And he looked at me and he said these words. He said, I don't know what I wouldn't have done if you hadn't walked through that door when you did. I don't know what I would have done if you hadn't walked through that door when you did. Strong with God. Strong with each other. Because the earth will quake. And everybody said, Amen. all right. I just want to take a moment, like a deep breath. I want you to just stand with me for a second all across the room. One more thing we're going to do. We don't have much time. One more thing we're going to do. So would you say hi to three people? Just turn around and say hi to three people. Sit right back down. All right, family. I want you to give a big hand for my friend, Pastor John Jennings. Good man right here. Good man. John oversees all of our grow area of ministry, all of our community and discipleship. And I wanted him to take a moment and just share his passion about what I've been talking about today and give us a couple of next steps so we can put into action this message. Take it away, John. Good morning, Pure Heart. Good to see you. Dan, that illustration of the Bay Bridge was so powerful, and it reminded me of something I read that was said by Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Bonhoeffer was a German theologian and pastor that had the courage to stand up against the Nazi regime, um, and it actually ended up costing him his life. But think about this in, in light of what Dan's been talking about. What a, what a powerful word. Bonhoeffer said, whoever cannot be alone should be aware of community. Yeah. But the reverse is also true. Whoever cannot stand being in community should be aware of being alone. You were called into the community of faith. The call was not meant for you alone. You are not alone, even when you die. If you neglect the community of other Christians, you reject the call of Jesus Christ, and thus your being alone can only be harmful for you. Bonhoeffer recognizes the profound truth that we sometimes need to be alone because that's where we renew our strength with God when in silence and solitude and times of worship and prayer. God sends his spirit and he refreshes us. But Bonhoeffer makes it very clear that if we neglect the community aspect of life with him, we are actually shortchanging ourselves. Yeah. And we actually become a harm to ourselves when we neglect the importance of community. And so here at Pure Heart, we recognize that. I, I learned a long time ago, Dan, as a pastor, that we can't force people into community no. as much as we preach about it and talk about it. But what we can do is provide opportunities for you. If you are new to Pure Heart Church, I'm so ready and excited to launch uh, our revamped starting point experience. It's going to run here at the Glendale campus during our 5.30 service on Saturday and during our 10.15 service on Sunday. If you've not yet gone through Starting Point or if right. you are new to the church, this is exactly what you need. It is your on-ramp into all things Pure Heart. We're going to talk about things like knowing God, finding freedom, making a difference, and then joining the team here at Pure Heart Church. So I would encourage you, and the way we've redesigned this, you can jump in at any time. If you yeah. can't give us four consecutive weeks, that's okay because it's going to repeat every single month month, the first three Sundays of every month, and then on our team night. So I'd encourage you to get plugged into that. Also, if you are looking for community, looking for a small group, we would love for you to go to the app. I checked this out this morning. You go to the app, you check on the groups tab there on the app, and it begins a list of all of our off-campus and on-campus groups that we have available. If you are interested in Monday Night Wellness and Support, go to the website at pureheart.org. It has all of our 14 different wellness and support groups that you can get involved in. This is something we want for you, yeah. and we would love for you to get involved and find that place of community with God and with others. And we Bless talk about it all the time to get out of these rows and get into circles so that you can be known. 
You know, this is so important in the family of God that you are connected with other people. And that's why if maybe if you have a passion to start a small group and you want to do that, please, please see John as well. We'd love for you to do that. Some of you are like, well, I've tried this. I tried going to a small group. I went to a couple of classes. It just didn't work. This is so important. We would never say that about other important things in life. We'd never say, you know, I tried eating once. You know, you wouldn't say that. You know, you try it again. If you had a bad meal, you're going to press on. I pressed on. That's what happened. Okay? I pressed on. That's the issue right there. And I keep pressing on. All right. You don't say that about exercise. I tried it once and I got sore. No, you, you press on. You want to get healthy. And communities are the same way. It might be way. six months later, but that's <laughs> what you press on. So we want you to dive in. We want you to get to know one another and get connected. Also, even with these calm cards that we passed out last weekend and again this weekend, this is a great way to find community as well. What are you passionate about? What, what is it in your life? You go, you know what? I want to help fix this or change this one injustice or problem in this world. And what would that be? Write it down. Put your name. Stop by. See the, the folks in the gray Popeye shirts out there that says, I can't, I've had all I can stand. I can't stand no more. And talk to them. They're going to pray with you and encourage you. Get connected with one another this year. And everybody said... Amen. Amen. Give John a big hand, would you? Come on, give him a big hand. So one more thing as we wrap up. So Paul has this, this powerful statement, everyone deserted me. At my first defense, everyone deserted me, Paul said. And then Paul goes back to his most constant relationship. The one who would never leave him, never forsake him. Because here's the deal, here's the deal. In Christian community, we're always, we're always going to have the propensity. We will always let each other down. Because we're not perfect. We're gonna fail expectations. Just turn to your neighbor and say, it's true. I can let you down. It's possible. But Paul goes to the one who would never let him down. And this is what he says right after everyone deserted me. He says this, but the Lord stood at my side. Can we say that together? But the Lord stood at my side. One more time. But the Lord stood at my side. And then he said, and gave me strength. He goes on at the end of this statement. He says, he will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. And then he ends it with a prayer. He says, to him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Bow your heads with me for just a moment. I don't want to end this series or end this service without giving you the opportunity to say, Jesus, would you lead my life? Would you heal my life? You're the only one who can. I want to trade my leadership for your leadership. I want to submit my life to you. I need your hope, your love, your forgiveness, your joy, your peace. And if that's you today listening online, Right now, you see the icon of a hand that's coming up on your screen. If you'd click that, in just a moment, I invite you to pray with the rest of us here in the auditorium. For the rest of us sitting here this morning in this safe place, and you're ready with your heads bowed all across the room, you say, you know what? For the first time, I want to say yes to Jesus. I need him to lead my life. I need to give all of this stuff, all my pain, all my hurt, all my future to him, everything to him. Maybe it's not a first time decision. Maybe today's a rededication of your life to Christ. You are not in this room listening online by chance. Jesus wanted this moment to slow you down long enough to remind you that he is in love with you and he is calling you back home to him. And so if that's you sitting here today and you're ready to make this all important decision, what we do in this safe place is we raise our hand high. When you're ready to make that decision, you raise your hand high. When you raise your hand high, you're saying, that's me and I need Jesus today. So if that's you without hesitation, we just raise your hand up right now all across the room. Just raise them up and say, that's it. Yeah, absolutely. Come on, keep raising them. Yes, and yes, keep raising them. Anyone else? Yeah, I see you right here. Fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. And over here, anyone else over here? I need Christ today. All of you with your hands raised, go ahead and put them down right now. Everybody online that clicked the button, pray this in your heart. God hears you. Say this, Lord Jesus, right now in this moment, I commit my life to you. I need your direction. I need your hope. I need your peace. I need your strength. But Jesus, would you forgive me of my sin? You, you know what it is. I can't hide it from you. I give it to you and I ask for forgiveness. Thank you. Tell him this. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for never giving up on me. I trust you with my life. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. amen. Let's give God a huge hand. That's fantastic.